Hey y'all, it's Jess and welcome back to my garden here at Roots and Refuge Farm. Today I want to talk to you about something that I get questioned about a lot since I do have such a large and diversely planted garden which is companion planting. Specifically today we're going to talk about companion planting in the fall garden and just kind of demystify the whole thing. Now when I set out to research these topics in order to bring this information to you guys, I'll be honest sometimes it gets a little overwhelming which is crazy because these are things that I've been successfully doing in my garden. My garden is incredibly diversified and I rely on a lot of companion planting. Now the style of my garden could be aptly described as a potage garden, which I will plug that word in right here so you know what it is I'm saying. That is a French gardening technique which relies on design and diversity in plants using both edibles and ornamentals to bring about a space that is both functional and beautiful. And a big part of potager gardening is companion planting. The problem is is that whenever you go on like Pinterest for instance and you type in companion planting guide, you get a lot of vague information like cutesy little charts that have pictures of different vegetables and it says do plant this with this but do not plant this with that it says things like tomatoes and then their likes and dislikes good companions or bad companions and maybe some of you aren't like this but for me I'm kind of a compulsive rule follower, which means if somebody tells me do or do not do something, I have a really hard time going against that rule. So whenever I start getting a lot of conflicting information, I'm like, ah, I don't know what to do. And my solution for that has always been to dig a little deeper and ask one very important question to people's advice, why? And I found the answer to the question why to be greatly lacking in a lot of information that gets circulated about companion planting. Those cutesy little charts are great, but it tells you this plant likes and dislikes these bed partners, but it doesn't tell you why. Now, I got a book called Carrots Love Tomatoes, and it's a great book. It's one of the better books that are out right now that gives a lot of information about companion planting, and it tells you all kinds of stuff. I'll link it below, I've read it, and I really do like it. However, I had a big problem because even the title, Carrots Love Tomatoes. The book goes on to talk about how these are great bed partners. Well, here in Arkansas, if you try to grow carrots during tomato season, you're gonna have a nice plant of carrot flowers with very little root because carrots don't grow here when it's hot outside. When the tomatoes are growing, it's always hot outside. 95 degrees outside during the day is pretty much the average here for the summer. You can't grow carrots here then. And so I thought, how are those great bed partners if you can't even grow them in the same season? One thing to understand about gardening is is that it differs so greatly by regions. So today I want to talk to you about companion planting and I want to give you some tips that I feel like are pretty universal tips no matter where you live. However, I want to talk a little bit about why some things are called good and bad companions for one another. The general idea to companion planting is that if you plant certain plants near one another, there are beneficial properties. So when you start to research what good companions are for each plant, what you're getting is that somewhere along the line, somebody connected that there was something beneficial about having these plants next to each other. That said, the most important thing to having a successful garden is to take care of your plants, providing their needs for water, light, nutrients, and space, period. If you do that, as well as good soil management practices, you're going to have a much better garden than if you meticulously plant by every companion planting chart while letting the rest of that stuff go. There's not a make it or break it companion to a plant that's going to make all the problems go away or kill the other plant. It just doesn't work that way. However, there are certain factors to take into consideration. Some plants just have different pH needs. You can test the acidity of your soil by either taking a soil sample into your local extension office or by buying a soil testing kit for less than $10 on Amazon or at your local hardware store. And there are some plants that really like very acidic soil, things like raspberries and blueberries. For the purpose of fall gardening, however, most all of the things that you would plant in a fall garden, things like root vegetables and brassicas and leafy greens and peas, maybe a second planting of beans or squash, all of these things do well in 
moderate to alkaline soil. So you don't really have to worry about companion planting things together that have vastly different soil needs. It, it all stays around the same. However, to prepare for your fall garden, since so many things do like a more alkaline soil, uh, garden lime is a really good addition that does bring down the acidity of the soil to bring it to a more alkaline level. Another thing that gets called into question as far as whether a plant is a good companion for another plant is soil stratosphere, which is basically saying don't plant this plant with that plant because they both have really shallow root systems and they'll be in competition with one another. Which I get that argument, but I think it probably holds very little weight when you really think about the fact for a long time people have planted all their tomatoes together all their eggplants together, all their peppers together, and obviously those are all sharing the same soil space and they typically do just fine. Plants have a way of moving their roots around to get to what they need. Companion planting for the sake of a plant being able to work its root system out, I don't know that that's really something that worrying about makes a big difference. Now one argument for companion planting, which is one of the main reasons why I companion plant, is for pest control. Now when I first got into companion planting, I read things like plant forage near your tomatoes because it repels tomato hornworms. And then this year, after I faithfully planted borage interspersed throughout all of my tomatoes, after I picked off about the 80th tomato hornworm, I was thinking, I don't know if that was good advice. There's not really a go-to thing that you're going to plant in your garden, especially a really big garden like this, that's going to just make all the pests go away. The way that companion planting works as far as pest control is, is one of a few ways. One, you can plant trap crops. Now nasturtium is a very popular companion plant to use during warm weather. However, it's very frost tender, so it's not gonna do you very good as far as fall gardening goes. Nasturtium is a trap crop, and it attracts a lot of the pests that would eat up the plants that you're trying to grow because they're so drawn to the nasturtium, so you can plant nasturtium all over your garden is basically a sacrifice to the negative pet. They get the nasturtium for dinner so that you get your garden vegetables for dinner, and that works. Another thing that companion plants can do for your crops is that they can help mask the smell. So for instance, if you planted all of your carrots all together in one place, well, whenever the rust flies came, which is one of the main pests that are drawn to carrots, they would find all your carrots all there. But if you were to plant a few of your carrots here and a few over there, and that you had different flowering herbs around them, specifically things like chamomile or calendula, these things would help mask the smell of your carrots and basically throw off the pest. Basically the idea is if you don't have all of one type of thing all together, those pests are not going to be so drawn to that one concentrated area where you have created the perfect ecosystem for that particular pest. Breaking it up and planting other things around them, specifically flowering herbs that are going to put off a smell to these pests, it can help deter those pests. And one of the big factors in companion planting when it comes to pest control is that in planting a variety of things that are going to be flowering at all different times that are all kinds of plants, especially like in the fall garden where you're going to be planting a lot of things like brassicas, leafy greens, and root vegetables that aren't going to flower. So whenever you intentionally plant some flowering plants during that time, what you're doing is you are creating a prime ecosystem for beneficial insects. Things like wasps and spiders don't freak out. I've been gardening for a long time and I have never been stung by a wasp or bit by a spider in my garden. And I see them all the time. I welcome them here because they kill pests. The beauty of companion planting is that in doing that, you can create a healthy ecosystem in your garden. Now I'm kind of in between my gardens right now. My summer stuff is really dying back and we are steadily putting the fall stuff in. It is yet to begin sprouting. However, I can show you here that in our garden beds, we had a lot of diversity. My marigolds are still here um, all throughout the beds. Um, of course, you can see zinnias here. We've got zinnias down on the other side. And there's borage spotted all throughout. There are herbs next to tomatoes, next to melons, next to peppers. Random little flower pots with things like this purslane, which is a succulent. There's okra. 
more tomatoes, there were cucumbers right here. Everything in our garden is completely mixed together, which has created such a beautiful ecosystem. Now, I'll tell you that if you're planning on broadcasting chemicals all over your garden, you're gonna miss out on a lot of the benefit of companion planting. Because like I said, there's not a magical combination of plants that you plant near each other that completely rids the other plants of all their problems. But in planting diversely, you can create an ecosystem that is healthy and beneficial so that it makes your organic gardening ventures a lot easier and more enjoyable. Let's talk really quick about nitrogen fixers, which is to say legumes like peas and beans. Basically what nitrogen fixers do is they draw nitrogen out of the air and they store it in their roots, therefore adding it back to the soil, but it's not quite that simple. Now often nitrogen fixers get listed in companion planting lists as good companions to plants that enjoy a lot of nitrogen. But there's a little bit of error in that because nitrogen fixers actually don't release the nitrogen into the soil until after the plant has died and been allowed to break down, therefore releasing its nitrogen. If you've ever pulled up a bean plant or a pea plant and you've seen on the roots these little uh, nodules, they just look like little bumps all over the roots. Those are the little nitrogen nodules. This is a really desirable thing and it's actually a response to a bacteria that can be naturally occurring in your soil called ribosia. Now you can aid this process along by buying what's called a bean inoculant I did like a major search locally around my area for that in a local store back in the spring and the best I found was like a one ounce pack at a local feed store. It was like $13 or something. I ended up finding a one pound bag on Amazon for around $20 and it was just like a granular mix that you added back into your soil. I will link it below. And what you basically do with that is you inoculate your soil, which is just like a vaccination. You, you essentially add a bacteria to infect your soil in order to cause your bean plants to extend the amount of nitrogen fixing they do to your soil. Once you've inoculated your soil once, that bacteria remains in your soil and it's a good thing. So all of that said, bean plants or pea plants are nitrogen fixers, but planting them to grow near nitrogen loving plants isn't going to do you very much good because while they're fixing the nitrogen, and storing it in their roots, they're not giving it up to the plant next to them that likes the nitrogen. It's actually better to plant your nitrogen fixers in the place where you had previously, the season before, a plant that was a heavy nitrogen feeder. Things like tomatoes are heavy feeders of nitrogen. So what I like to do is come in here where I've pulled out my tomato plants as they've been, as they have been succumbing at, through the summer. And this is where I will plant peas and pole beans here in the fall in order to help restore that nitrogen back to the soil. So it's not exactly companion planting, but it is smart crop rotation. Okay, so I know that doesn't really tell you exactly how to lay out your garden. That doesn't really tell you plant the kohlrabi next to the broccoli rob, because the fact of the matter is, I don't know that that hugely matters. Just being completely honest, when I lay out my garden, I lay it out, one, for diversity, two, to make sure that the pH needs of each plant is met. I take into consideration the water needs of a plant. For instance, cucumbers need a lot of water. So I wouldn't want to put my cucumbers and squash all together in one bed. I like to break those up and let them be companions to plants that don't need that much water so that they're not all choking each other out and making me have to come down and water them way more than I want to. Take into consideration the space requirements of what you're planting and how big that plant is going to get when it's full grown. Behind me, these are okra plants and they are massive. Now, whenever I first planted this bed, these okra plants were obviously just tiny little sprouts and so I had a row of radishes next to them and a row of kale. And I knew that as these got so large that it would shield the sun, which comes up from over here, and shade this area that those radishes would already be harvested being just a one month variety and that the kale would begin to succumb to the heat. And sure enough, those things died out about the time that the okra was here and now in the middle of August, the okra is seven feet tall. One big part of companion planning is taking stuff like that into consideration. 
So as I'm planting my raised garden beds, I like to consider how large things are gonna get. Now, a lot of the stuff that you plant in fall gardening doesn't get massive, like huge tomato plants or okra. We're planting mostly lettuces and leafy things like kales and chards. We're planting broccoli plants, cauliflowers. These are kind of low-lying things, nothing that's going to really tower. Even the flowers that we're talking about planting, like chamomile and calendula, and borage. actually learned that that is a good companion plant for cold weather. I assumed that borage would succumb to frost because it tastes like a cucumber to me. And so somewhere in my mind I made that connection. However, I recently read that it is frost hardy, so I will be putting that in my fall garden as a companion plant because it is great for pollinators. But even these flowering plants, they don't get very large. You're talking about maybe 24 inches, maybe a little bit more than that. They're not massive plants. So as you're planting all of this stuff, especially planting from seed, one thing that you can do, flanking your larger plant, things like chard that might get up in the 18 to 24 inches range, when you first plant all these, do plant some radishes next to it. Things that you're gonna harvest before this reaches maturity. Same thing with kales or broccolis. Any of the things that are gonna get a little bit of height to them, good companion plants to those would be root vegetables. And like I said, you don't really have to worry very much about the pH needs being different because most things that you plant in fall have very similar pH needs. This might not have been the video that you were hoping for. I don't want to add just another list of plant this with that, likes and dislikes, do and don't. Because honestly, I think that there's already enough of that. And I'm not debating that the research behind that stuff is good and sound and that there are scientific reasons why one plant would benefit another. I'm just saying that I personally have read enough guides telling me to plant my broccoli next to my chili peppers. That was just an example. I don't know if they actually say that. I'm just saying so many of those guides do not even remotely take your region or your climate into consideration. And more than anything, I would say the plants that you need to be planting this fall are cold weather plants, period. So really briefly, I'm gonna tell you some things that grow well in cold weather. Peas are frost hardy. Carrots, radishes, beets, turnips, kohlrabi, kale, collard greens, mustard greens, arugula, salad greens, spinach, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, broccoli rob. And if you are in a warmer climate, the things that you're going to be planting a second wave of, uh, you better get on it because we're really getting to the time it needs to get in the ground, are things like cucumbers, squash, crowder peas or black eyed peas, and a second wave of pole beans or green beans. All of these are shorter season varieties that typically come to maturity in under 60 days. So you still have time to plant them if you live in regions like six or seven, uh, down to 10, you've still got time to plant those things whenever it's the middle of August. So plan your fall garden and plan it diversely. Mix all of those things up. Plant a little bit here and a little bit there. The way I like to do it is like I'm growing 10 varieties of radishes and so I'll have one small section and I will grow a hundred of one type of radish there. And then next to it, I'll have one of the types of broccoli rob that I'm growing. And then next to that, I'll have some of the salad greens I'm growing. And then right next to that, one of the types of kale that I'm growing. And then we'll do a trellis with peas. And then we'll start over with another kind of radish. It's all just mixed in together and dotted throughout. I'll grow cold hardy flowering plants. Things like borage, chamomile, calendula. Things that are not cold hardy that are typically thought of as companion plants are nasturtiums, marigolds, and zinnias. Those are some of my favorite things to plant when it's warm. Those are great companion plants. Pollinators love them and they are a great natural habitat to many beneficial insects. However, they will bite the dust the first time you have a cold night. So what I'm doing is I'm letting those things that currently exist in the garden kind of ride their course knowing that they're going to die when it gets cold and I am adding in new flowering companion plants mixed and interspersed throughout all of the other things that I'm planting. I hope that you will feel encouraged to just diversify your planning and not be worried that you're going to mess something up. I promise you, you will get more from your garden if you just go ahead and plant it than if you sit on your seeds and sit on your soil worrying that you might do something wrong and in that talking yourself out of doing anything at all. To sum it up, my opinion of companion planting is this. It creates a beautiful and enjoyable space that is a positive and healthy ecosystem 
for beneficial insects. It helps to break up what would be the ideal ecosystem for your negative pests. And in my opinion, it just makes gardening more fun. And I think that has to hold a little bit of weight when we're talking about something that we are pouring so much of our time and effort into. I hope this helps you. I hope that you feel freedom and you feel no longer confused about companion planting and that you will have great success in your fall garden. Thank you so much for watching. I bless you. Until next time. Mm -hmm.